All right, welcome. Today's Tuesday, March 17th, second day of magnetism. Um, if you haven't done so already, make sure you follow us on Twitch so you can type in chat and make sure to do that. And then uh, if you scroll down, you can see our YouTube link. Make sure you uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. We're trying to get to 100 subscribers. Uh, I believe at 100, I get to get my own custom or personalized URL. So uh, no, no, don't, don't donate, don't donate. Uh, maybe if I did like a variety stream of like, if I become like a gamer streamer or something, um, but for now, no. <laughs> but anyway, but please do subscribe to YouTube, uh, your territory. <laughs> Uh, subscribe to YouTube so we can get to 100 subscribers. That will allow us to get the uh, the custom URL for for the YouTube page. That will be really cool. Um, all right. So so yeah. So let's get started. Go and take out your notes. We want to talk about magnetism. We'll talk actually about some chemistry things, uh, maybe to get like a, a, a better picture or a bigger picture point of view, and then we'll dive straight into what we were talking about yesterday. <laughs> What's wrong with chemistry? What's your question, Torben? Uh, I have to type my question. Uh, for the compass aligning with the magnet, magnetic field, is it that the needle is a magnet and the north side points in the direction of the field? Yes, that is very correct. So the compass is a small, tiny magnet, like a small, tiny test charge that shows you the electric force in an electric field. The small, tiny compass will show you the direction of the magnetic field. Now, on the outside of a magnetic field, if we uh, take a look at yesterday's picture, on the outside of the electric, uh, oh, sorry, magnetic, uh, uh, the outside of the magnet, so imagine this big bar magnet being your magnet, and the circle thing is your compass. On the outside of the bar magnet, the field points from the north side to the south side. Therefore, your compass will align itself such that the north end of your compass will point in the same direction as the field itself. So essentially, the north side of your compass is going to point towards the south side of the bigger, larger magnet. Okay? Uh, you weren't here yesterday. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay. oh, you weren't here yesterday. Yeah, that is true. Uh, you missed quite a lot then. <laughs> Make sure you watch, uh, watch the video on... Uh, on our YouTube channel, so you can always uh, catch up. Hmm. Uh, you know, this would be cool if, uh, if you know, on lecture days we did this, but, like, I still want, like, those four-hour, once-a-week lab days that colleges have. Uh, unfortunately, we can't have that. If we can somehow do this and have our lab days, have our work days and our project days, that would be... That would be good, right? What, what's no? What, what do you mean no? Uh, I totally never missed. Uh, about three people just left. Left? Oh, they did. Uh, that is unfortunate. Where is everyone anyway? Is everyone still sleeping? No, I think we have some AP1 students that are just watching or something. Yeah. Those are the AP1 kids, probably most likely. As a class, we are less uh, 250. Yeah, that is true. The, uh, the uh, yeah. First of all, the first truth is that it is uh, downgraded or upgraded. I don't know how you want to say it to fifty or less people now, right? Um, and then, Effie uh, uh, probably sleeping until like five p.m. Oh God. <laughs> oh, I think I know who Torben is. It's Mark. <laughs> Uh, all right. Anyway. Oh, you all knew? Oh, I just figured it out. I guess I'm slow. Mm -hmm. I thought it was, when I first saw it, I thought it was Jacob's second account. <laughs> Only Jacob would do something like that. <laughs> no, we're fun. <laughs> How are those uh, uh, Inovio stocks doing, man? <laughs> All right, anyway, uh-oh, uh, I lost my place. Uh, what am I looking at? APC. What happened? Is it an AP1? No. Honors? No.
Uh, how did I? Well, time to start again. Oh, there it is. Magnetism. Okay, so the chemistry stuff. Let's get started. No more, no more uh, distractions. Uh, so uh, there are a couple of things, uh, a couple of words that you might uh, need to know, especially if you're going to go into science uh, next year in college. Uh, paramagnetism and diamagnetism. Okay, this is a uh, this is what we were talking about technically yesterday when we were. Uh, realigning our domains um, t uh, usually in the paramagnetism you have unpaired electrons now it doesn't necessarily mean odd uh, that's because recall that in each orbital, uh, orbital you can have two electrons right um, so technically if you have two in your outer shells you can have one that's up here and one that is up here. These are the spin states. The up represents up spin states. Oops. Okay. So if you have it in different orbitals, that actually also makes it paramagnetic. Um, recall that electrons can have two different spin states, up spin or down spin. Okay. So actually, in reality, let me tell you what actually happens. Okay, remember we're going to use our left hand rule for electrons. Okay, so if you use your left hand with the thumbs up, the curl of your hand goes around this way. Okay, whereas with the thumbs down, the curl goes this way. All right, now in reality, you can actually have spin states in all axes. So the spin can be like this and have a downwards or something, like a diagonal. Right? So you don't actually know what the spin state is and therefore it could be in any orientation when you have a generic electron. It's just that when we actually interact with it, we cl you know collapse the wave function. Uh, oh, okay, cool. We collapse the wave function and we force it to choose these two uh, states. So 50% of the time, it's almost like if you, this is where I, I show you a quick demonstration of like uh, where uh, if you flip a coin on its axis, so here's our coin. What's on the back side of a coin? Oh, very good. Following. Um, I don't know, an eagle or what is it? Some plants. I don't even know. Okay, here's our coin. Uh, recall that we're spinning our coin around the uh, IY axis, not through IZ. Anyone remember what the moment of inertia of a spinning disk is when you're moving around the Y axis? Nobody, nope. Ooh. You're not too. I review your mechanics notes. Uh, parallel axis thing. Very good, very good. Uh, recall that IX plus IY equals IZ. Is that right? Is that parallel axis theorem? Or is that the perpendicular axis theorem? Ah, there we go. Yes, that is the perpendicular. Uh, and recall that if you go through the Z axis, right? What's the z-axis for a disk? Well, for a disk, it'll be 1 half mr squared. Remember, hoop it. No, no, no. Hoop is mr squared. Stop it. <laughs> oh, this is not going well. How do I delete my message? <laughs> All right. Uh, so, so a hoop is mr squared. The disk is half mr squared. And we know that ix and iy... Uh, are, are symmetric, so whether you do it through the x-axis or the y-axis, they're symmetric, therefore it has to be one-fourth. Alright, anyway, 
That was a quick me APC mechanics segue, or sorry, tangent. Um, but in any case, uh, imagine a coin that is flipping around. Um, as it exists in its flipping state, uh, it is both heads and tails. Basically, an electron would exist in both up and spin down states, meaning it could be in any orientation any time. Uh, what we can do is actually use a magnetic field to reorient the spin state of the electron. And therefore, when we interact with it, we can force it to take spin up state or spin down state half the time. <laughs> yeah, we're, you're supposed to create a, you don't want to create a hostile work environment. So this is, this is why we're using, you know, uh, our gamer tags and whatnot. So we can, you know, uh, participate without any repercussions. So uh, feel free to participate. Don't worry. Uh, we can always ban hammer anyone who uh, messes around. <laughs> Gamer twenty seven, Monka. Oh my gosh! Don't don't Monka S in here. <laughs> All right. Uh, so paramagnetism is where you can realign the domains. Now you can do that because your electrons have a preferred uh, magnetic mo uh, moment. Okay, so this allows the paramagnetic materials kind of to align itself with its uh, with the external magnetic field you may put put it in. So uh, similar to how when you put a compass uh, in the vicinity of a uh, a magnet, the external magnetic field. I hope <laughs> I hope you're gonna watch this video again because uh, uh, you're not getting the information right now at least. Uh, so uh, when you put the uh, compass in the external magnetic field, it'll realign itself uh, because it is a paramagnetic material. So iron uh, would be a para would be paramagnetic. Uh, chemistry students, did you guys do the para and dia uh, uh, demonstration where um, where you, uh, remember how you put like a little toothpick on, on on water and then you can use a magnet and then like push the toothpick away? Yeah, nice. So essentially, a toothpick, which is wood. Um, is diamagnetic. So just remember, it starts with die. Die means death. So death to magnetism. <laughs> no, it actually gets repelled. Instead of realigning its domains, it does the opposite. Um, that's because in diamagnetic, no unpaired electrons. Okay. Uh, so when you have uh, an up state in that same orbital, you have a second down state. Uh, if you remember your 1s2, 2s2s, right? Every orbital uh, can house up to two electrons. Uh, even the p orbitals in each axis, whether it's the pz axis, uh, you can have electrons. And why is that? Well, the anyone remember uh, what this is called? The blank blank principle. Two words. First word begins with a P. Second word begins with an E. The blank, blank, no, not the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Heisenberg starts with an H. <laughs> uh, Fussy is the prince of pal. Because he's a pal. Uh, poly, very good. The poly exclusion principle. Um, so now, and so now you know why there is a poly exclusion principle. This is because the spin states creates a magnetic moment, and therefore, if you have two magnets that are aligned the same way, they will repel each other, like so. Uh, and therefore, in order to house this, the two electrons, we have to have opposite spins, so they have opposite magnetic moments, and they can align themselves. So if you have two bar magnets, right? If you have two bar magnets with a north and a south, a north and a south, you don't actually want to put them next to each other. If you do, they will fight each other and kind of destroy each other, therefore get weaker as as they go on. The Cal... Whoa, whoa, whoa. All right. How do I do a timeout? Uh... <laughs> Hostile. There is no timeout feature? Ban username sword hero one. Boom. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> all right that was our first ban i've never banned anyone but uh it feels necessary <laughs> All right, we'll just give you a timeout. I know how to unban, so uh, hopefully you're still paying attention. <laughs> yes. All right, so anyway, for the rest of us, uh, when you have two um, two magnets that are next to each other, you don't want to line them up so that the nor two norths are next to each other and the two south are next to each other. The magnetic fields will kind of fight each other and kind of destroy each other. Therefore, uh, when you do store magnets, Right, either use an insulating device or uh, this is how I store my magnets. They come in packages of two. What I do is uh, I have one uh, right side up and the other one upside down, kind of like inserting two batteries. Recall that we want our batteries to be in series. Similarly, we want our magnets to be in series. So we'll put uh, upside down, south and north this way. Okay, uh, in here we'll have a Uh, a rubber-like material so the ceramics don't scratch each other, right? So a soft material. Um, actually, it shouldn't be that big. Uh, it should be just as big as the magnets themselves. So a soft material. Soft rubber. Okay. And then, and then what you do is you kind of create a short circuit with your magnets. Uh, so short circuit with your magnets, meaning we'll use a tiny little metal clip and make them touch. Okay, and so by doing this, what we're doing is uh, we are realigning the magnetic field. Remember, on the outside, it goes out of the north, and so it'll go through our metal plate, and then it will into the south, uh, and then out this way, and then in through the south to the north, and we've created a nice loop. So this will realign the magnetic field so that they stay nice and strong. Basically, when you put magnets end to end, north, south, north, south, like this, you're actually aligning all the domains so that the magnets basically get stronger. Okay. All right. Notice how whether I'm above or below, doesn't really matter, the direction of the magnetic field is to the right. Yeah, magnet series is opposite orientation next to each other. Yeah, and then we use little metal clips to kind of strengthen strengthen the realignment. All right, uh, I think we can let Jacob back in. Unban sword hero. I'm sure he learned his lesson. <laughs> or did he leave the stream? I think he left the stream, probably. Oh, no, he didn't. Someone else left. <laughs> no, no, no. We're not going to do magnets and parallel magnets in series. Uh, all right. All right. Anyway. Uh, make sure you understand how to draw the magnetic field lines. Sorry, they're not re really field lines. They are field loops, technically. Um, they come out of the north, so going this way, and then around to the right here at the top. It's also to the right at the, uh, at the bottom. That's because it comes out of the north in both directions. Uh, one pathway goes upwards, one pathway goes downwards. And then it goes all the way around. And then inside of the magnets, they'll go through from south to north. And then inside of the magnet, it'll go through from south to north. Magnet loop loss. <laughs> All right. So there you have it. Uh, the reason why diamagnetic will repel is because once you have um, once you have them in this orientation, they are basically uh, kind of self-sufficient in that their magnetic field lines on the X, uh, outside of the shell, the or electron orbital, um, are kind of closed already. So any other uh, magnetic fields that may exist will repel it, and it just gets pushed away. Because yeah, the magnetic field lines can't actually intersect. All right, going back to our PowerPoint. So boom, this is where we left off. Uh, we have a uniform magnetic field in between our magnets. 
Okay, we get some nice straight lines. So of course, uh, near the edges we get bendy lines, but we don't really care. Uh, what you can do, actually, uh, is take just a bar magnet. So to make a uniform magnetic field, the easiest way to do it is, is to take a bar magnet. So here's our bar magnet. So here's north, here's south. It goes out of the north, into the south, blah, blah, blah. Okay, anyway, uh, what you do is you bend it. Physically apply force to bend this bar magnet so that it looks like this. What do we call this? Let me draw it in 3D. You ma yeah, horseshoe magnet, very good. Horseshoe magnet. Oh, look at that, 3D. Uh, yeah, electromagnets are like near the end of the first part. Okay, so again, we just bent it so it turns into a U. So our north side is now over here, and our south side is over here. Okay, so remember, this is a bar, so this is technically a rectangular prism. Like so. And so we bent it. Okay, now what does this do? Why do we bend? Uh, why do we, you know, bend it this way into a horseshoe? Well, recall that the electro, uh, th sorry, the magnetic fields um, are are going from the north side to the south side, outside of the magnet. Therefore, in between, right here, you have um, a uniform magnetic field. So that's why horseshoe magnets are useful. We have a sort, uh, sh sorry, short region where we have a uniform magnetic field. Just near the top. Now, of course, if you go out, like up top here, it will bend like this. So, but we don't want to use that portion. We just want to stick to the part that is uh, actually uniform, which is right between the north and the south. All right, very cool. Nishank is the north to my south. Excellent. <laughs> the physics C gang, or the physics of love. You just got to find your uh, opposite pole. All right. Uh, now, what's happening on the inside of our horseshoe magnet? What is happening on the inside of a horseshoe magnet? Remember, on the inside, it must be going from the south to the north, south to the north. So on the inside, we are going from the south end and then up around this U and then back through. So it curls. Yeah, we're, we're losing, I guess we're losing people because people are losing interest. I don't know. I guess uh, uh, we were told that attention span is somewhere around 30 minutes and beyond 30 minutes our brains turn into mush uh, <laughs> yeah not probably Andrew Boo and Lukey <laughs> I know right so chat keeps us keeps us going all right so anyway uh, creating a horseshoe magnet we can have our very own Uniform magnetic field. All right. So magnetism, electricity, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to skip that. And boom, here's our first, first actual law and rule and all that stuff. Uh, actually, I'm not going to do this one. Uh, we're gonna, can I? Uh, we'll get to the bias of art law later, I suppose. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, so the first ever uh, discovery was like 
this physicist named Orsted, uh, Hans Christian Orsted, really. Uh, and this dude, you know, figured out that if you have a current carrying wire, um, it generates a magnetic field around it. All right. Yeah, if you take the subject test, then you'll know. So anyway, uh, a current carrying wire produces a magnetic field around it. So here in this picture, uh, showing you that the current is the uh, is the thumb, and the curl of your finger. If you use your right hand rule, the curl cur uh, curl of your finger tells you the direction of the magnetic field. So using your right hand rule, so current has a direction. It's the flow of positive charges. So I'll use current as a vector, and so the curl is the B field. Well, let me use a different color, blue. So this blue curl represents the magnetic field. Of course, the further out you are, so based on this radius r, the further out you are, r2, the weaker the field is. But it still goes in the same direction, all the way around. So you get these concentric, ow, concentric circles around your wire. And it's not just at one spot, it's everywhere. So you can imagine Gaussian cylinders around this wire. Ooh, what would you see is Gauss's law. We'll, we'll get there. Yes, so for current, uh, for current carrying wire, this is a right-hand rule number one. For current carrying wire, uh, thumb equals current, direction of current. All right, and then uh, the curl of fingers, curl, is the magnetic field. Okay. All right, but you have to draw it in 3D. You have to draw it in 3D. Uh, recall that when we do 3D vectors, we use arrows, uh, like a 3D arrow that is going into the board or out of the board. So uh, if you recall, so 3D vectors. Um, here's our arrow. If the arrow is coming towards you, then you're going to get stabbed in the eye with this point. So you see a dot uh, with a point out of the board or page. Uh, if the arrow is leaving you, going into the board, um, go ahead and uh, draw the tail end of your arrow. So if you draw the tail end of your arrow, you form that X. Like so. And so you see a circle with an X, and that's into the board or page. Should we ban him again? Do we need to ban him? Is he distracting us? <laughs> the people have spoken. <laughs> uh, oh, here, let's try a, let's try something. So let's, you know, distract that attention span quick. Here. Uh, let's do a poll. Ooh, I can do a poll using. My stream labs. So, then, check mark, question mark. Uh, yes. Confirm. Yes. And then, no. Confirm. No. Done. All right. So, start poll. Bam. There it is. We're doing a poll. And what you do is you type. Um, exclamation point vote space and then yes or no so you have to type exclamation vote space and then yes or no I'll just leave the yes for now <laughs> ah ooh
discrimination of minority. <laughs> oh no. Uh, uh, I'm stopping as soon as I get my 16 votes in. Uh, we have 10 votes so far. Do, 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 do. Oh yeah, oops. Yeah, fifteen uh, viewers. You are right. All right, I'm gonna hit. Uh, dash, vote, done. Uh, I wonder if I count. Oh, I do count. All right. Yep. All right. Closing poll in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Yay. We did our first poll. Boom. You can no longer vote. Um, how do you show the results? Oh, that's the results. Yes was the most voted option of the poll with 76.92%. <laughs> All right, you're in timeout for one minute to slash ban sword hero one. <laughs> the ban hammer. All right, going back uh, to our stream labs. Boom. So, uh, so let's go ahead and draw our our wire in three D. So 3D wire. So imagine the wire go uh, having current flowing in the positive y-axis. Well, he has to wait a minute before I unban him. All right, so the direction of current is upwards. All right, let's focus. Direction of current is upwards in the y-axis. Remember, the magnetic field is three-dimensional. It curls around around the wire in 3D space. Uh, however, a lot of times what you do is you're only drawing the magnetic field on a two-dimensional plane. Let, hashtag let Jacob self-learn magnetism. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. All right, so it's on a two-dimensional on a two-dimensional plane. Remember the the curl of your fingers, okay, come outwards on the left side, and then they go inwards on the right side. So as you curl your finger around this wire, you'll see that the fingers point outwards, so the arrows are coming towards your face. So we're going to draw a circle with dots, or just dots. Just dots is also fine. On the left side. And then as you curl all the way around, it goes into the board on the right side. So X, 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 X. Okay, so on a two-dimensional plane, we have X's on the left. Uh, I said that wrong. Uh, circle with dots on the left, X's on the right. Can we show the strength of the field using this model? Uh, As far as I know, how these pictures are drawn, typically, um, typically they're used for uniform magnetic fields uh, for your, for your, um, for your problems. Uh, but with any diagram, uh, high density. If you have lots of dots, uh, means high. De oh, so let's do high density with any model. High density of dots or X's. equals high magnetic field and low density indicates a uh, low strength so that's the way to show um, strength of the field all right so you draw more dots or you do more x's or less dots and less x's oh very good stephen gong all right anyway so wires have this inherent magnetic field around it as long as the current is moving or there's a movement of charges all right Hopefully you've learned your lesson, Jacob. Your one minute ban is up. Sword hero one. 
and uh, and here we go. Now, what's interesting is that instead of having just a straight wire, we're going to make the wire into a curl, so rotating it around. And what ends up happening is that we get a field that looks exactly like a bar magnet. This diagram is very important, so make sure you understand what is happening here. Now the wire is looped around in the YZ plane. We have current going in this direction. Okay. On the AP, there was a question like that, and yes, high density equals stronger field. Uh, thanks, bud. <laughs> Ah, oh, this person is from the future. <laughs> All right, uh, how is this like a bar magnet? Very good. Um, so imagine the current going up this side, and of course it'll go around. So on the top side of our loop, it'll go this way, and on the uh, on the back side, it'll go this way. Eventually, it'll come back down along the other end uh, of the wire. Okay. Like so. Okay. So uh, now what you want to do again is use your right hand rule number one. This is still a current carrying wire. Therefore, it is creating a magnetic field around it. And so the field is like a little tiny curl. So if you grab your grab your wire on this end, remember this is a coming out of the board in the YZ plane, in the YZ plane. Um, and so the loop goes around like so. So on the front end, on the left side, um, if, you, if you draw it big enough, so if you were to grab the wire uh, on the top side, you'll see that you stick your thumb or in the direction of the current, right, upwards, and your fingers curl around so that on the inner side of the loop, the fingers come out. And on the, out, uh, on the other side of the loop, the fingers go in. So there's this net vector that points this way. Okay. You want to compare that to a bar magnet. Remember, in a bar magnet, what's going on? Uh, I took the class last year. Ooh, he took the class last year. Still on PowerPoint. Ah, are you a former student? Wow, welcome, welcome. We are honored that you have come to watch our stream. Oh, I'm on PowerPoint. Oh, my bad. There we go. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I've been drawing all this time. <laughs> Starting again. You're not honors physics, stop it. All right, um, so here's current I. It is going up one channel, one part of the wire. Okay, everyone. Uh, it's going to go around the loop. Again, the loop is in the YZ plane. It goes around the loop, and then it goes down the other side. Okay, so when I grab the wire uh, right here, like so, okay, you'll see that the curl of your fingers uh, The curl of your fingers um, go around and then they go into the loop on the inside of the loop, right? So all of these curls point in this general direction. And recall that if you had a, a magnet, right, um, on the inside of a magnet, the field lines or the loops go from the south end to the north end. So if we are, uh, if this were a bar magnet, Okay, this would be this spot right here in space. Uh, oh no. Oh wait, never mind. I was confused by the diagram. Remember, this is in the YZ plane. So on the inside, on the uh, through the middle of the loop, the fingers go in uh, and out 
uh, towards my bottom left. All right, so uh, at this spot in space, we have a south pole. And therefore, by virtue of that being the south pole, this automatically is the north pole. Okay. And so from south to north on the inside, and then on the outside, we will curl all the way around, and then eventually go back into the south. Like so. So essentially, by making a looped wire, we are making our own bar magnet. So this is the essence of electromagnets in that we can use the moving charges to create a magnetic field around a wire. And then by adding up all of the magnetic field vectors, we get a pretty decent magnet. Now, one loop is not enough because, uh, you know, one loop just gives you the strength of every little infinitesimal dq that is moving around and therefore in order to strengthen your magnetic field what you do is make a bunch of loops whoa whoa no uh inductors later don't talk about inductors right now um, so if you put a bunch of loops like we do here we get what is called a solenoid a solenoid uh, is similar to our electromagnet we're just not quite there yet we'll get there we'll build our own electromagnet but a solenoid is basically a bunch of loops and the strength of the magnetic field okay the strength of the magnetic field will multiply purely based on that value n the more loops you have the stronger your linearly the stronger your magnetic field is okay so we've created a magnetic field uh, let's go ahead and figure out how to actually measure it. Okay. Um, okay. So the magnetic field, uh, can you see the PowerPoint? Yeah, you can. Or, yeah. B for a solenoid. Solenoid, which is many, many loops. Um, theoretically, yes. And, and when you look at the equation, you'll understand how that will work. It's really about loop density rather than just the technical size of the loop. However, remember the loop density will be a function based on the length of the uh, wire that you have. Therefore, there's only certain amount of loops that you can make based on your finite uh, amount of wire that you have. So uh, B... Um, is equal to uh, a new constant. Whoa, a new constant. It is the permeability of free space. When we talk about permittivity of free space, this is permeability of free space. Just uh, in order to remember the difference, remember the magnetic field is B. So instead of permittivity, we have permeability um, of free space. And uh, can you not? Yes, can you? That's pretty good. Who was that? Torben, wireless high five for that one. Wireless high five. <laughs> mu naught. And so it's equal to mu naught times n over l times i. Okay. So of course, B is the magnetic field. measured in capital T Teslas. Oops, I should do units. Okay. Uh, mu naught is the permeability. So permittivity, remember, is a spatial constant which uh, tells you how easy or how difficult it is for the electric force to permeate through the fabric through, through the quantum field of space itself um, permeability is basically the same thing but for magnetism they are actually related you can get the permittivity of free space from the permeability of free space uh, but we will just remember it as 4 pi uh, 
4 pi times 10 to the negative 7. Uh, oh, I'm lagging. What is going on? Uh, we will use Gauss's law eventually, but just not, just not yet. We'll talk about solenoids uh, a little bit later. This is all right. Uh, can someone verify that? What is 4 pi? Yes, they are related. They are related. Uh, just remember the two quantum fields, the electric and magnetic fields, are related to each other in that they're both 90 degrees to each other. So even their constants uh, are related. What do you What is 4 times pi? Is it like 12 something? Cool. Um, oh, someone ha put it in decimal form. Chalky, chalky, chalky milk, chocolate milk. Uh, 1.25 times 10 to the negative 6. So, yeah. Ew, 4 pi equals 12. Ah, Ryan Davis, excellent. Uh, 4 pi e negative 7. Uh, we'll use e, uh, 4 pi just because, uh, remember, when we do our Gaussian surface integrals, we'll eventually get those 4 pi's back again. So really cool. Uh, so keep it as 4 pi. Don't use the decimal um, unless you actually have to uh, plug, it, plug it in. Yeah, we're, we're losing our viewers. Remember the attention span? Yeah, we're already at 46 minutes, so it's, uh, it's decreasing as a function of 1 over t squared. And for those of you, uh, recall that when you have 1 over a variable, it's exponential decay, not a straight line that goes downwards. <laughs> All right, um, so per... <laughs> Ban Mr. Z. What? <laughs> that is true. I am creating a hostile. No, I'm just giving you a reminder. I'm just giving you a reminder that exponential decay is inverse proportionality, not a negative slope. <laughs> uh, all right. So anyway, uh, what is n? n is the number of loops. Number of loops okay and l would be the length of the solenoid so length would be the curly part so how long linear how long the solenoid is uh, and therefore uh, you can actually do loops per length which is a loop density Nishank left? Ah, oh, Nishank. That is unfortunate. Uh, and so you can write loop density when you have n over l. You can write it as lowercase n, which is loop density. Which means number of hashtag loops, number of loops, over meters. Can you stack loops on top of each other if the wire is insulated? Yes, that's what we do when we build our solenoids. So you want to use um, insulated wire. Now, um, some insulation obviously are thicker than others. So uh, what you can do is use red lacquer paint, and that red lacquer paint can be uh, can can insulate you from the other wires, so the wires can essentially touch each other, and therefore you can increase your density 
by squishing the loops closer in, decreasing L. Remember, L is the size of your solenoid. So you have more loops per length, and this will essentially increase the magnetic field that you get. This B that we're calculating, okay, the B that we're calculating is inside the solenoid. And inside the solenoid, we have a, a nice constant B. And if you have an ideal solenoid, on the outside, you actually have 0B, essentially. Yeah, so we'll, we'll get to those uh, things uh, down the line. Um, but for today, we're just kind of introducing uh, the basics. Um, tomorrow, we'll talk about the force that we experience. Uh, and then we'll eventually move on to how we get to this uh, solenoid rule anyway. Remember, the solenoid rule is easy because we are essentially only making measurements of the things that we can see. Uh, we made measurements of current, okay? Uh, we can definitely count how many loops we have per length, and if I multiply those and I see that all of the values are always off by a constant, then we define the constant as a constant of the universe, and voila, we have our own equation. Boom. Oh, I wasn't on the right screen. Does it not give a magnetic field when it's insulated? Uh, it does. It still works. You cannot stop magnetic fields from electrical insulation. The insulation is to stop the charges from short-circuiting the wire. Um, so, yeah. Uh, there is a way to insulate things magnetically, which we call magnetic shielding. And that's what most uh, electronic devices now have. Uh, they're shielded magnetically, so uh, you know external magnetic fields don't mess them up. Um, if you recall, you know, uh, if you use mag, no, don't actually, I, I won't tell you. Never mind, that was close. Uh, but when we get back to school, we'll see how these magnetic fields can impact unshielded or can impact charges that are moving in unshielded uh, devices. So everything wait wait so what's the what's what's what they use for MRI right uh, yeah so the MRI machine externally is magnetically shielded uh, now the reason why we're alive we never really talked about it is because of this field right so we know that the earth creates its field remember the south is near the north and then the north is actually near the south the field goes from south to north on the inside and then it comes around and loops around like so and this is happening in 3D space, so you have to imagine this in, in 3D. And of course, the closer ones are stronger, the farther ones are weaker. All right. And so when a charged particle, as we'll find out next time, when a charged particle with some velocity comes in, um, it basically gets deflected. It feels a force that is 90 degrees, and so it starts to accelerate 90 degrees, which means it takes a... Uh, parabolic trajectory uh, parabolic uh, sorry not a parabolic trajectory but a curved path that is essentially a circle because the uh, uh, the field is always 90 degrees to the direction as long as you come in uh, 90 degrees to the field itself and so harsh particles that that are coming from the Sun uh, get deflected away and never crash into the earth now, little tiny particles can get through, like neutrinos can get through, um, you know, and when they do get through, basically it's, it, it kills us. It destroys, um, one way to destroy the planet, like Mars, uh, that basically has no atmosphere, is because these particles will bombard the air molecules and send the air molecules off into outer space. Uh, therefore, the magnetic field can't capture the atmosphere and keep it intact. Um, it just, you know, blows the air molecules away, basically making meaning you can't breathe the air. Now, if you want to breathe what Martian air, it does have some atmosphere. It's very thin. It doesn't mean there's no air, not like the moon. It has a very thin layer, but it's a lot of, you know, CO2. So if you ever, uh, if you ever just stuck your nose at the top of your glass uh, after you pour, uh, pour some soda or, coca-cola uh, into your glass 
those bubbles that pop, if you smell those bubbles, that's basically uh, what CO2 smells like, right? And so you would have to take a high concentration of CO2. Um, that'll be Martian air. Um, uh, we, we do like a little uh, a demo in class where, uh, where I use dry ice and then put it into a tank and then put some water so it starts to uh, uh, sublimate. As the solid turns into the gas, the CO2 comes out. And if you breathe straight up CO2, you get this really, you know, spiky, uh, you know, a, a quick burst of, uh, you know, it's almost like breathing in needles, uh, but you get this spiky, you know, sharp pain. Uh, but, you know, it's part of uh, learning physics, I suppose. Yes. All right. So until next time. <laughs> You can't get high on CO2. Remember, you breathe in CO2, right? You don't just breathe in oxygen. You actually breathe in everything. Your, your nose does not filter out all of the other stuff that you don't need. You breathe in everything. You keep a little bit of the oxygen, and then you breathe out a bunch of stuff. You know, you're not 100% efficient, so you also breathe out some of the oxygen, too. Uh, but a majority of the stuff you breathe out, obviously, is nitrogen, and then there's some carbon dioxide. Oh. Uh, make sure you do your uh, chapter summaries. Uh, I will open up um, Mastering Physics so you can get started on that. Um, you know, continue to study. Don't don't give up. Uh, we're going to continue to learn. Make sure we are prepared. Make sure we pass our AP test whenever that is. All right. Until next time. See you later. Woo. Yes. Oh yeah. Follow us on on um on youtube i need that 100 subscribers to get our custom url link see ya